and which he then compares, saying how beautiful it is compared with New York, Paris, is that Barcelona, I don't know, but how wonderful it would be compared with these traditional cities. Um, and I think it ends up here, in Golden Bay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it does. I think that that sort of mad patterning, this is a guess, of course, is actually something that ends up making the grass. It's a sort of um, homage, homage, I suppose. Um, and in fact, you know, Corbusier never builds any of those patterns. This is, in a way, uh, how, it, how, it, how it ends up. You know. so there we are at the moment. <coughs> um, all right. Well, just looking at the buildings for a minute. How am I doing? Uh, just looking at the buildings for a minute. Um, well, you probably know it, 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 the trick. It's a terrific trick that they put the they put the stairwell into the main living space. So the main living space sweeps up into the into the stairwell, and it's got the full width of the module, which is a four foot module. It's a four foot four inch tartan module um, planning grid. So thirteen foot, which is exactly. Um, Three meters, four meters, thereabouts. <laughs> um, so there's this ter terrific, yeah, this brilliant thing which is gives you this wonderful, uh, wonderful spaciousness, which is truly, truly beautiful in a very, very, in a really small flat, a flat that never, 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 ever feels in the slightest bit tight, uh, but just has this sort of generosity, of spatial generosity in it, uh, achieved by that way, you know, which is then you escape, if you don't know, you escape through your neighbour's bedroom <laughs> on, the, on the back balcony in order to have an open stair. <laughs> you escape uh, through your neighbour's bedroom, um, <laughs> knocking first. <laughs> And there's, these, there's, these, these, there's not many of these left, but these are heating. These are sort of uh, these are hot water hot water heating elements on which are on the windows. Um, I, and I know an old resident said that you know when they had those, it, the, the flats weren't drafty, and now they're drafty. Um, and I don't know if they, you know, but you can see they're an attempt to heat the cold air pouring off this colossal double height. Uh, uh, glass facade, um, but also somehow or other they remind me a little bit of this this draw, drawing by Gordon Callan and this photograph, which might be Eric de Mai. Um, so that's the section. Um, I don't want to spend too much time doing it, but the, but just to say. I mean, it, it, the unit is a very odd building. He, he, you know, it, for didactic reasons, Corbusier makes a frame, and it no, it's no, no way on earth that it needs to have a frame. But the unit is built as a frame in order to, in order to fulfil this prediction that is made in a model that some of his hand is sliding this flat into it. Um, and, you know, but any architect would think, and any QS. You know, if I may use that word, <laughs> um, you know, interesting. But these are slid in. They're on. They're on lead pads. The flats are actually actually sit on lead pads and then onto the frame. Um, whereas, I mean, it's basically the blocks in. In Golden Lane, they're really old-fashioned, uh, um, you know, cross walls and and, the, and being stiffened up by the floor, which all your architects will know is called. I'm completely out of my head. Cross wall construction. 
Um, so basically, there's sort of that very sort of standard thing, and they don't have any sort of pretensions that way. But they, but then they do very very weird things. This bedroom, which is here, this is then the double height above the stair, and this bedroom, which does this, is is hung. The bedroom sort of hung or balanced through the floor, I guess. I think the, I think these steels are run through the party wall. Do you know? No, can I ask about load bearing on that bedroom because I have a water bed and tons of books. <laughs> um, well, I think as long as you, you don't share the water bed, I think you. <laughs> um, and and not, yeah, I mean the stair famously, you know, cantilevers out of the wall, so. It's very interesting that it does, you know, and the top, the top flat has to turn through right angles in order to stiffen the block, in order to get a sort of spine wall or a spine running down the block at the, at the top level. This is a form that, that the engineers can't, uh, can't take up to the top. And the engineers are um, Arabs. Arabs are the engineers. Um, this is this wonderful thing, which again is... Uh, this, this incredible, incredible door that slides up, and I think Cabuchet would have loved this because they were made in aircraft factories. They were made in, in factories which, after the war, hadn't been making Spitfires and Hurricanes. Um, you know, um, old ladies knitted the, the, the brave pilot's vests, you know, sort of. um, and these doors were made in, these, mine was made in Mitcham in, a, in an aircraft factory and I think Cabuse would have loved that, that, it, that this is industrial production but also somehow related to aircraft. Um, and the woodwork in the, in the flats is incredibly straightforward. I think it's all sort of like from stock. It, it looks as if nothing is, you know, it looks as if it's just simply stock sizes of timber. Um, so, it, and that's just a, a lovely contrast that somehow all of, all the interior cupboards and the partition the partition between the two bedrooms is achieved just with cupboards. It's done with this fantastically straightforward carpentry, and then you get this rather magical and and sophisticated windows. This terrific thing that sort of lifts up and runs round on a on a bicycle chain with this this thing balancing balancing it. Um, and the back window too, the sliding window slides across the balustrade on the balcony is also really, really, really beautiful. Um, and, and Cabuzio says somewhere, and again I think it was after the unit A was finished and it sort of probably surprised him about the winter light, how deep the winter light gets into the building. And because of the double height, it, it, it's, it's an extraordinarily beautiful feature of these, of these flats, is this winter light. Um, this one, this picture, it's like nip, but the sun gets right to the back wall of the flat in midwinter, right the way through to, to, the, uh, to, the, um, to the, because of this double height, you get this wonderful uh, penetration of light so that even in the even right at the end of the year right at the lowest point of the sun it's almost as the sun comes down to the to its azimuth is it called that you get this it's almost like a, a present a mid a midwinter gift uh, of, of direct sunlight sliding straight into right through the apartment um, well, regulating lines, um, you know, the, 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 his insistence that about something, about proportionality, that things have to be proportioned. Um, and when you look at this facade, you, it's obvious that, that, that how proportionate it is. It's, there's squares everywhere, and then consequently golden means everywhere as well. Um, um, and so, you know, and of course, it, this is the stair, this is the sort of cantilever stair, there's this wonderful spaciness. Um, but in a way, I've come to the conclusion that it's really the proportions which are the most beautiful. They're like, um, 
They're like a, an insistent, simple truth. Um, uh, that's it, it, uh, that's always available, always present, um, and uh, that's what I that, that's what I think is uh, is uh, is um, the deepest thing about uh, living in one of these places. Um, all right. Who you remind us to architects? This, this is one of his early definitions of architecture. architecture. Architecture is the masterly, correct, and magnificent play of masses brought together in light. Out of eyes made to see forms in light, light and shade reveal these forms. Cubes, cones, spheres, cylinders, and or pyramids are the great primary forms which light reveals to advantage. The image of these is distinct and tangible within us. And without ambiguity. Yeah. <laughs> Difficult to argue. You know, again, with just this wonderful sort of poetic conviction <clears throat> in, in his in his in his uh, in his business. Um, his definition. Um, and I always think, you know, somehow or other, you know, like a, a tray of things. Somehow that's almost so. That, his definition, you know, his pure forms held up in light, and I, these these things which meet you at the at the at the different entrances onto the estate are like that. They're like a tray with things stood on them, I think. And but when you look at Cubusier, you know, this is you know, the model of the Unité roof, of course. Um, you can you can see you get, get, just to see the width of his genius. You can see him working up these shapes. Through painting, through painting still lives that, you know, in the 20th century tradition, are essentially things which are on a tabletop or on a tray on this sort of flat surface, and are these pure forms standing about on them. Um, but as this is a building built in London, I was also reminded by this <laughs> famous London painting, this, uh, the Annunciation by Crivelli in the National Gallery. Um, where this saint has a little city on a tray <laughs> which is distracting this angel with you know, some would say typical architect <laughs> <laughs> in, the, in La Ville Contemporaine uh, this, is, this is not me pointing it out but you know you suddenly get this sort of little set of wiggly chairs and a coffee pot and, and I do think that this sort of notion of this, uh, and Corby uses chairs very, very close to this in, in earlier things, in earlier schemes. But, you know, it makes you think of the antelope chair by Ernest Trace. Um, and, of course, if one thought of, thought of any, any object, I think any piece of furniture, to typify the 50s and the influence of the Festival of Britain, it would be the antelope chair, I think. Um, and, you know, if you look at the cover of the Festival of Britain, you see it's got the same colour scheme as the Golden Lane Estate. Red, blue and this, uh, and this uh, um, sort of citrus green. And you can see that this is a drawing by Gordon Cullen, not out of the Festival of Britain, but uh, it does envisage this world of, uh, of people sitting about in the outside world on these sort of slightly wobbly metal chairs. This is sort of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the chair, and that's, I suppose this is where I want to introduce who I think is a person equally as, as influential on this as, estate as uh, as Le Corbusier. That's Gordon Cullen, um, you know, whose stock goes. I wouldn't say it certainly was very very low at one point. So I'd like at this point to to uh, uh, to suggest his his his, his reconsideration. Um, well, and with Norman Cullen, the whole sort of Queen Anne's Gate gang, the whole architectural review, architectural press gang, <coughs> the whole sort of mafia, um, which which ran architecture in England during the 1950s, you know. They built a pub, you know, the Queen of Denmark in the basement, and in that pub, Casson and the rest of them, uh, uh, the Wolf, um, planned the Festival of Britain, you know. 
um, 